Welcome back, friends and scoundrels. I'm Bran. And I'm Lynn. And this is Horror in the Hills. And movie book. And today we're doing The Mist. Which is another weird one. Why is it? Or an intro to weird ones. Because it's not a full book on its own. It's a short story by Mr. Stefan King. Apparently and it's when he's at his best, though. So says the Denver Post. I do prefer his short stories most of the time over his longer format stuff. Because there's not enough, usually not enough room for him to have his kingisms. He's got to focus too much on what needs to actually be done. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess that's the intro. Oh, we got to do the things. You don't really have a synopsis, do you? I don't. I just have a scary picture of Stephen King on the back. Well, while we take a moment to find that, you want to read us a review? <laughs> I just did. Stephen King, at his best. So, The Mist. Following a violent thunderstorm, artist David Drayton and a small town community come under vicious attack from creatures prowling in a thick and unnatural mist. Local rumors point to an experiment called the Arrowhead Project, conducted in a nearby top secret military base, but questions as to the origins of the deadly vapor are secondary to the group's overall chances for survival. Retreating to a local supermarket, Drayton and the survivors must face off against each other before taking a united stand against an enemy they cannot see. Huh. I wouldn't exactly call the vapor itself deadly. It's not poisonous to breathe or anything. <laughs> Spoilers, that's also not how the story goes <laughs> at all. I mean, they do have to face off against each other, but they do not unite. No, they really don't. I mean, if you count their two separate groups that end up ultimately forming by the end. Well, I mean three if you count the ones that aren't committed to either side. Mm. You don't really get a sense of that in the movie. They, the third group in the movie is Brent and his cadre that go out on their own and then just kind of dealing with stuff and people's shifting from one side to the other until they're little tiny group and everybody else that's the two small groups and everybody else hmm. i mean it's it's hard to say because like everybody's present at the end the final confrontation in the supermarket Mm -hmm. but only a small group participate I said, because everybody's there. It's hard to distinguish who's from what. Although I suppose there's a few scenes I didn't really pay attention to those parts. I felt I was pretty much done taking notes on the things that I wanted to talk about because I didn't want to, I don't want to spend too much time on the religious aspect of it. If you want to, that's fine. With the crazy lady? Yeah. No. There's plenty of other opportunity for that in other movies. But, um, I've got here the story setting up David as a rational person. Yeah. And by him trying to explain the mist at the beginning, you know, there's a scientific explanation, you know, he... he tries to be cordial in his potential confrontation with Brent at the beginning because of their past history. So he a little bit more laid back too about things. Yeah. And I, I just find that part to be particularly important because for a long time he does kind of becomes the crazy guy that no one wants to listen to. David? Mm-hmm. Because he's telling his fantastical stories about, you know, these tentacles and... Weird noises in the dark. Yeah. And and even um, Mrs. Crazy... God, why can't I remember her name? I literally just got done watching this movie. Carmody. Um... He's not necessarily the crazy guy, but he's still not going along with what they want. So he still seems irrational to 
that group of people. To the middle people? No. To to the Bible people. To oh. Miss Carmody's group. <clears throat> she doesn't necessarily come off as crazy to them, because she calls them devils and monsters out there. So it's mm. not that she doesn't believe there's devils and monsters out there. I said irrational. Because they're not wanting to stay. And they're not willing to accept God's will. So to those people, they would seem irrational. All right, because I didn't make any notes on that. Maybe. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. But a large part of this story is about perspective. I don't think the woman who thinks human sacrifice will fix everything has ways to say what's rational. From... A, a normal position, no, but we're not talking about from our position, we're talking about her position. And I make a big deal about the thing between Brent and David for some reason. <laughs> Maybe because of the sides they represent and more rational conversation. But, it, you know, the dichotomy between them where the storm happens and David is just kind of like, yeah, this happened. At least we're not hurt. Let's, you know start getting things taken care of another part of that rational like just all right shit's happened let's move on and just get through this where the introduction with brent is he's trying to start his chainsaw and he's cussing and screaming and yeah upset and showing how how much more uh brash and impulsive he is He's quick to anger. He's also the type to try to control things or want to be in control in a way. Because the chainsaw is not working and it's lack of control. That's why he's getting upset. At least as I'm feeling it. I suppose so. Uh, I thought it just kind of set up that, uh, oh, you don't understand what another person's going through because it isn't until on pun closer expect inspection that David realizes maybe everything he thought with Brent isn't really what it was, but it doesn't change the way he feels about him ultimately. But really, Brent's now long, around long enough for me to make any notes on it. Oh. <laughs> He's around quite a while in the movie. I mean, the movie's two hours long. It's He's like the second pretty nuts. guy. Wow. Probably not far off from that second in the movie. It's just there's a lot more that happens in between things. He's gone before the first night. Oh, yeah. But there's but still a lot that happens. There's really not. Hmm. They just argue about whether or not it's safe to go outside repeatedly and eat candy bars. And he refuses to go and look at the dead tentacle. Yes. Which is where their big conflict actually is in the story. His denial. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I don't know if I want to spend too much time on that. No, let's just keep talking about this part that I actually want to. Okay. Because I, I made some notes about uh, Miss Brepler and her conversation about schools. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If, is that in there? Lack of funding and how the government spends all this money on bombs and all this other crap. Bailouts for corporations. I can't remember. But that's not what this episode's about. I'm trying to be more focused on it. All right. Be more focused then. Um, so then we got after earthquake, whatever, probably monster stomping around, but we don't get any confirmation at that because it's at the beginning while everybody's still standing in line waiting to buy their stuff and go home. Because mm -hmm. um, that's where we have the mother who's trying to go home to her kids. Yeah. And it's after, after um, what's his name, comes running. is like, there's something in the mist. Don't go into the mist. And it, it just, it's another moment. I don't think it's as good as the moment in Train to Basan, Um, About the conflict of self-interest between people. Because she, in a way, she needs to get home to her kids. Yeah. To take care of them. And that's her self-interest. But you've also got David with his son there and Brent and Jim and all the other people that are afraid and don't want to go out. They don't want to die. Well, David's got his wife back home. 
Mm-hmm. The babysitter has her husband and kids back home. Hmm. And she tries to talk to David about it. Uh, and he's still unwilling to admit that she's probably dead. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's just no knowing, right? Until you know in this situation. Especially given how the end, the mom who goes home to her kids at the very beginning gets saved. Oh, she does in the movie. Not in the book. But it just, it's something that you see a lot that, you know, this woman wants to get home to her kids. And a lot of times people will look at everybody else and be like, oh, they're terrible people. Why is nobody helping her? Well, because they don't want to die. And they they have got a really good idea that going outside is death. Up until it's time to unclog the exhaust and they egg each other on into it. Hmm. No matter the fact that David said there's something out there, don't do it. You wouldn't help that woman home, but now you're more than ready to throw your life away to run out that door for nothing. Yeah, but it just, I, I look at it as like, we can't look at it as either, either of these sides being bad because like this is a tough situation in those moments, those extreme and extraordinary situations you're gonna have to make decisions yeah and like i do like the the moment in train to Passan and hopefully i get to talk about that someday if not i will find a way to do it better <laughs> but it, it this one isn't bad as far as some of them go because again like no party is correct here and no party is necessarily in the wrong I'm going to disagree with you there and say the murder the child, it'll fix everything party is wrong. We haven't even gotten to that part yet. We're not even talking about that. We're talking about the self-interest in the moment. Spoilers. <laughs> um, the conflict on the loading dock, I think there's quite a bit of difference here. Um, given the comments that David makes... David is the king stand-in in this story, I'm assuming. Not a writer, but still an artist type. Yeah. Um, essentially making fun of their toxic masculinity. Big fat air quotes around that. And I put the air quotes around it because it's, it's understandable in this situation. Because um, they're like generally speaking men are programmed to fix things and provide things and oh what else do i have here and help and do all these things and go out and and take on challenges right right but as humans also in general we seek to control as much as we can especially the less control there is and they have no control over the situation right so you got to fix the things you can yeah. Um, but it's also creating a distraction for them. Yes. To get their mind off of everything else for a moment. And it's, you know, we do see that Jim and his boys are low educated, low skilled, meaning they're really good at what they do, but that's all they know. So um, if, if they had more capabilities, it would be a little bit less frightening for them in a way. Is my point there. Yeah. Um, oh, I am going to talk about that a little bit because you got the same thing with the Luddites going back that far and their fear of technology coming in because they only had this one skill in their lives and this machine was replacing them. And, you know, it's, that is scary because what are you going to do for work if this other thing replaces you? Yeah. So having more skills keeps you safe from that. But it's a conversation that we see creep up every now and again as technology advances. Right now, we're starting the conversation about driverless cars and trucks and all these truck drivers that are going to be out of jobs because I talk about lowest of low skills. <laughs> Not to say that what they do isn't important. It's just we're talking about the job itself. Yeah. Because as we've seen over the last couple of years, truck drivers are hugely important getting things across, at least the way our system set up currently, getting things across the country from one place to another. You know, we're smack dab in the middle, so from both sides. So getting anything here 
it, there's a lot of stops on the way. Yeah. And people will take their priority over others. As we've kind of already talked about, that self-interest thing. Especially when it's people that you can't see and you don't know. But also having those other skills and stuff would, would allow them to be more adaptable to the situation and overcome things. That's why David doesn't get freaked out as much. Even though he's an artist, he, he demonstrates an ability to work on things in his home. And knowledge of cars and all kinds of different things. Also some creativity and curiosity in there. That helps a lot. I suppose so. I feel like he mostly just holds it together for his son. Well, and that's a huge thing, too. That is a large driving force for many adults. Keeping your shit together for your kids, because it doesn't do anybody get any good if you lose control of a situation you already don't have control of. But it's interesting, when the woman goes to leave, the self-interest, no one wants to go with her, but when they go out... Uh, to the loading dock to fix the generator, they're arguing over who gets to go out. The bag boy or Jim. Yeah. To fix it. Well, it, it, So how is that argument framed in the book? Because this is where I think it might be a little bit different. What do you mean? Well, because there is an argument in the movie, and a lot of the argument stems from David trying to keep them from going out. Yes, that's and what happens. And the bag boy... Um, offers himself up. And David's like, no, he's just a kid. So Jim steps up and he says, well, what if I go out as a man? And Bag Boy gets upset because he feels like they're saying that he is incapable of doing it because he's a child. It's just David trying to talk both of them out of it. Okay. Which, I mean, makes sense. But also from their perspective, running on the limited information they have. Um, it's hard to understand, which I'll talk a little bit better about that later. Um, but it's also funny, the toxic masculinity thing, because David is the one who essentially makes a comment and something about um, questioning their manhood or whatever. Yeah. Do they think I'm questioning their manhood? Pissing contests and all that. Yeah. But then after the bag boy gets dragged out, even he's resorts to a more primal, more primitive type action in attacking Jim. Physically assaults him. He does physically assault him. Because he blames him for Norm's death. Well, and it just trying to make sense of a nonsensical situation. But it, it really does bring up that stronger question of what actually is toxic masculinity. And I don't think there's any such thing as toxic masculinity. There are certain traits that men will kind of exhibit that are toxic, and there are traits that females exhibit that are highly toxic. Yeah, they do. But those lines, those barriers around those, or those boundaries around those things are very limited um, cause I've seen just as many women who are full of bravado and machismo as I have men. And it really, they're just traits that are toxic in general to humanity, from humanity, that we ascribe to one gender because you bad. Yeah. For whatever reason. And I, I get it, because men have been the ones that have been in power for the majority of our history, blah, 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 blah. There are plenty of women that have been in power that have made up for that gap on their own. Bloody Mary. <laughs> well, you've named one. Elizabeth was no angel herself. She was not. I mean, most of the Protestant Catholic wars or some of the worst of the Protestant Catholic wars in England happened under her reign We've gone off topic a little bit because we were talking about this toxic crap I'm just trying to illustrate some balance here, right that I mean still Let's be real men have been in power through most of history, but 
It's not the fact that they were men why these terrible things happen. They were right. terrible people is the reason why this stuff happened. Right, right, right. Right, right, right. Speaking of toxicity, in a way. Um, you see the breaking off of people into different groups right from the start. Yeah. Some of it is just we already know each other, so we're going to kind of congregate. Yeah. Um, Brent being a little bit of an exception, especially as a leader figure, mm-hmm. because he's an outsider from town. Yes. You townies always sticking together. But from a leadership perspective, it's it's interesting to see what goes on here because you point out there the majority of people don't care one way or the other. They just kind of want to get through it. They're the civilians. I mean, they're well, all they're... technically civilians, but you know, in movies, you've got your background civilians, the ones that just float around. Well, it just especially the last few years since... Trump's election, really, you've seen it's the small extreme groups Mm -hmm. at the fringes, um, however many sides there are, because there are multiple, it's not just left or right, libertarians have their own bullshit, and commies, and socialists, and whoever else, you know, the, the religious fundamentalists, and MAGA group and Antifa and like all these different groups they're not the majority of the population they're these fringe elements yeah that seem to can they seem very big bold underlying capital letters seem to control the narrative of what's going on in the country because they're at these extreme ends pulling like a tug of war while everybody else is kind of stuck in the middle, being dragged to one side or the other, what do I want to say? Casualties, yeah. if you will, of the situ- of these different situations, and it being a casualty will often drive people to one extreme or the other from the opposite side, whoever they think caused the most harm. Which is why you might see some of the back and forth of people moving from one group to another. Yeah. You know, they pick a side, but then that side isn't necessarily right, or they get hurt and decide, no, I have to be against that because for me, that is the worst thing that happens. Or there's new information, or in the case of this book, new deaths. Yeah. Um, Most of the deaths don't seem necessarily consequential to people's decisions. They're just, they happen, at least as far as the, the... people that we follow through the story. The people that we follow through the story don't really themselves change sides with the exception of Jim and his buddy going from the middle ground to uh, crazy religious lady. It's everybody else. With each death, her side gets bigger. There are more people willing to listen to her crazy. It starts to make more sense. Well, and that's... Did I finish that thought? We often are drawn to those leaders who validate what we already are feeling, or those who make us feel the most safe. No, we didn't cover that. That is definitely a big case here. It's hard to want to listen to David when he's the one telling you how scary and dangerous it is and how there's nothing that can be done about it. But Facts or not. By him doing that... It, it forces people to that other extreme, right? Yes. The saviorness of it that God offers. Yes. And you've got Brent and his group that they're not wrong in some of their thinking because, you know, they want to kind of have a conversation but control the conversation. And they're operating from, you know, what they actually know and are aware of and can define within their strict boundaries of control, right? And that's ultimately what brings them down is because, like, they look at what they know and anything beyond that they treat as speculation. Even if there is potential evidence, they're not open to seeing it. 
I, I think that it's more of a limit of Brent's psyche and his mind trying to hold itself together, as it were, for his sanity. I think on some level he might know that David's right. There's something out there. Otherwise, why would he and Ollie be so convinced, just come look at this dead tentacle? But as long as he doesn't look at it, he can keep pretending it's not there. Yeah. You know how lawyers like to deny the evidence. Mm, depends on what kind of lawyer they are. <laughs> Fancy New York lawyer. But it's, you've got, you know, these times of great confusion and fear that mm, illustrate how people are willing to stick to the things they know, as is the case with Brant. And that Dylan sometimes will invent stories because it's easier than the truth, which is essentially what you're just saying. It is. So I have to make sure I didn't read through my notes as I started taking new notes, so. Because <laughs> I think in, in, in Brett's case, it's kind of like a Lovecraftian thing with the holding on to his sanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is definitely um, one of Stephen King's attempts at exploring the cosmic horror element, which usually gets into more of an existential thing than actual cosmicness I think yeah this is usually Lovecraft is dealing with people going insane and I think that's a lot of what the mist is I think their Carmody side is going religiously insane which is still a form of insane but I think David's side also to an extent is too there's or they can feel the edges of it creeping in, and everything they do is like a mad scrabble um, to keep their sanity. They are... More than anything else. They demonstrate much more um, operating from a place of uh, desperation. Because as, as things go on, they start making decisions in reaction to things instead of... Whereas, like... Um, God dang it... <laughs> Carmody, she offers a proactive approach in a way. Like, this is God's will. We just have to follow. You know, not necessarily a, this is going to happen and there's nothing that we can do about it, but there's something already in place. This is what I'm poorly trying to explain. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do agree with your desperation thing, but I think I'm right, too, about the it's all an attempt to keep sanity because David does have those thoughts that if he thinks about the fact that his wife's already dead, he'll lose it. He focuses on when they go to the drugstore to see if anyone's alive there. Grabbing comic books for his son is a single physical thing to focus on when he realizes the carnage they've walked into. Yeah. To, again keep his mind intact, focusing on those little things. Token? Yes. Hmm. Sorry. The uh, Inception thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> um, kind of touched on this a little bit, but let's explore it a little bit more, shall we? Or try to, anyways. If we must. We must. Uh, another strong element to the story, um, like I said, is working with information that they have, especially as individuals. Mm -hmm. So, because many of the conflicts occur as a result of limited information or contradictory information. So, like, the um, loading dock situation is more a contradiction of information that turns into There are 60 limited people in information. the store and only four people saw it happen. Well, and David's hearing noises yet when everybody else we get, does get other people to go back with him. Um, there aren't any noises, and you could understand them. You know, how many times have we done ourselves? Right. It, it's dark, and we don't know what's going on, and we hear a little noise, and our brain blows it out of proportion. Right. So, like, that's that's my interpretation What, without it being said in any way what everybody else is thinking happened with David. 
Oh, they come right out and say that's what happened with David. They say, David, I'm sure your mind's just playing tricks on you. It's dark. Maybe. I might have missed that taking notes. But, um, so that's that contradictory information. So they're like, mm, no, we're not hearing anything. Maybe you just heard, you know, some pebbles falling or something. and Or nothing at all. It's dark. The fumes from the generator that are being blown back in. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also clear moments of unwillingness to be receptive to information after the loading dock with Brent, um, trying to get him to help and he chooses to believe that they're messing with him rather than accept that there might actually be something else going on, yeah. which you've talked about a little bit. But it also illustrates that will as people will are often all of us very guilty of relying on our first source of information especially if new information contradicts that original information or proves it outright false well you know what they say about first impressions the same goes for your first source of information it's what's going to stick and and it's a very sad thing because it keeps us from finding the truth in situations like this where we really need to. Um, this has become one of my favorite quotes and it's long, but here's the, another reason for that is, um, we define ourselves in the context of our world. When the world changes, it puts our understanding of ourselves under stress and it upsets our relationship with the world we live in. When that happens, we have two options, try to restore the past or to change with it. It's like, the number one thing I think I've, I took away from um, the power of strangers. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's talking about religion in a lot of ways in that moment, but it's so true in so many moments. And how many people can you like put down their um, fear yeah. to that the world is changing and it's upsetting how they view the world. And then... My last point under this little section is lack of transparency breeds conspiracy. And that... When they start hiding the fact that people have been killing themselves? Um, no, because it doesn't get too deep into that. Mm. It's just, I can't pinpoint any specific moments where anybody is trying to hide information from anybody in the movie, even though it's two hours long. Other than, like, the kids and stuff, but... Like after the loading dock, he's trying to keep it down low on the down low and trying to help get people that will be influential to see what's going on. Yeah. So that way they can have a conversation and figure out the best approach, right? Right. But um, it's just something that kind of stands out to me because we see this so much in life. And the things that have the most conspiracy surrounding them mm -hmm. are things that have the least amount of transparency about what actually happened. And I, I think, too, it's one of those things that's going to happen when you try to get the alpha personalities to try to get on all on board one thing. Because kind of. that's kind of what it is, because you've got David and Brent and Kermati and not Ollie, but the other... Dean? Owner. The manager or whatever? Yeah, the one who's just worried about people stealing from the store and everything. Mm. That all have these alpha personalities, and that's what draws groups to them and why there's not other people coming out. But you, when you have alpha personalities together, it's hard to get them to agree on anything. True. Like, even what to have for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone survival situations. Because the alpha personality isn't going to give in and let someone else be right. Yeah, which is something that, that's my other point to conspiracies, is that sometimes even if we see something, the truth of something, if it's so far out there, our brains will invent whatever to override that. Again, going back to Brent with, no, they're just trying to play a joke on me, which is like... Why would they be trying to play this kind of prank on you at this moment, dude? 
Even if he went back and saw the tentacle, it would be a toy, a prop. Yeah. He would continue to deny it. I know. Because he can't, his mind can't handle it. It's protecting itself. <laughs> Which is my point. We, you know, make up these stories that are even more ridiculous than the truth sometimes in an effort to protect ourselves. And usually it ends up having the opposite effect. Because we make decisions based on what our brain accepts. And as it proves with Brent, he goes out with his group and they all die. But back to the lack of transparency thing real quick. Is that the less information that people are giving, especially, especially if it's um, the less accurate or correct it is, the more they're going to fill in those gaps themselves. Which is probably something you were going to get to with the uh, people killing themselves. Yeah. And that cover-up. Yeah. Well, because that's part of the Arrowhead Project conspiracy thing, too. Because the two of the people that kill themselves are from that project. Military mm. people. Yeah, and that's something that's touched on at the beginning. Because, um, again, everybody's, what do they even do up there? Brent asked David, what do they even do up there when they're on their way into town? Brent, or David's, I don't know, probably some weapons manufacturing or something. Because when David... Weapons testing, or I forget exactly what he says. When David and Ollie find their bodies, they say they must know something we don't, that there's nothing we can do about it. That it's better to just off yourself... That there's no escape. Well, and even in that death, they're just speculating on that, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, most of the other people that we see kill themselves, they do it out of hopelessness, really. Yeah. Which uh, I, I would venture to say, I don't have the actual numbers on it, but a leading cause of people killing themselves is something changes so drastically in their life that they begin to experience this hopelessness and... It's very sudden, and they can't deal with it. Yeah. And it, like, it's why it seems weird for some of these people, because there's not a history of depression or anything. It just seems out of the blue. And I would also venture to say most of those deaths in that regard are men, especially since men make up 90% of the suicides. But they often come after divorces, loss of job... You know, things like that. Yeah. Again, those situations that create a sense of hopelessness. <sighs> Which, and that desperation thing again, because Hattie, um, the real estate agent who kills herself, takes much pills. Mm -hmm. Um, But also Joe, he catches on fire. I believe his name is Joe. Well, he didn't kill himself. That was No, but he wants them to kill him because he's in such great pain. Oh, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And... Again, that desperation. But David's decision to try to get out, and he's rightfully afraid of Carmody's group and what they're capable of. And it's more appealing to take that risk of the unknown in this situation than to stick with what you do know. Yeah. Because at least out there, maybe they're far. the monsters are far enough away that we can get to the car. You know, we saw them get this far, and I'm not near that far out. You know, the logic of we didn't, we didn't hear, you know, there was, there was the earthquake, but we didn't hear that metal tearing sound that cars make in an accident mm. in a parking lot full of cars. Yeah. The, the metal screeching. Yes. And, you know, given some of the more recent events in America, especially, um, there's been quite a few times I've been more worried about people's reaction to events than I have the events themselves. Because we can be quite monstrous. Yeah. I know I know people get caught up and hate the idea of we were the monsters all along, but like there's a reason why people do that in horror stories. And that's what uh Halloween Kills was. You know, how monstrous are we compared to this actual monstrous thing? Mm. I haven't talked a whole lot about fear and its role in all of this either. I mean, we have a little bit, but not explored it 
too in depthly. So there's a moment, and I put the timestamp on here. So at about one hour and twelve minutes into the movie, um, this is when David's really getting into his. We need to get the hell out of here before everybody starts taking her side and they start turning on us and things inside the store get worse than they are outside. Yeah. And it, it's fear is such a powerful tool to make people malleable. It's something that we've known for thousands of years. I mean, the Romans were really good at this. You know, before them, they probably used it, you know, the middle ages, even now. Yeah. If you want to get people to do something, the most effective way to do that is to make them afraid. Yep. And it, it's particularly scary, additionally scary, because under the correct circumstances, people will allow, and some of them even do things they never thought were imaginable before. Like calling for a child sacrifice. Yeah. Which is like... I don't get that one. If you're trying to save the innocent, why would you sacrifice the innocent? Like Because I, he's the only child there. Because David's the opposition. To hurt him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and also illustrating how even though she thinks she's being rational, she's rationalized things in her own mind. And to... Um, the the sinner thing because david and amanda sneak off to a closet it's an office mm-hmm. so they're adulterers and fornicators which i'm gonna say so glad they left that out of the movie wish they left it out of the book so it is completely unnecessary and i'm gonna say counterintuitive to everything that david's character is supposed to be his, his loyalty to his family. Mm-hmm. Like, you're holding on to this hope that your wife is alive, so you're going to have exactly. sex with this other woman who, for all we know, is faithful is. to her husband. Yeah. And I'm sorry. Like, I'm in that situation. Sex is probably going to be the last thing on my mind. Because <laughs> there is still a sex moment. It, they don't finish but it's um the newer soldier boy yeah and shelly the bad girl or not bad girl the cashier because she's not married she they went to high school together Mm -hmm. and i had a crush on you but i never followed through on it now's our chance before we die and she's like nah i don't want to do it like this and then dies like right away (laughs) so that's like the only illusion to sex there no, it's, it's why they get picked out. It's the rationale behind picking them out is the sacrifices, because she's a whore and he's an adulterer. And yeah, which they leave in. Bring the boy and the whore too. I'm like, well, what's your basis that she's a whore? I, maybe there's some rumors earlier that I missed. I don't know. I feel like that's a thing. Um, but it, one of those things that just. It's a line in the book, so let's throw it in. It's because it's because Carmati's um, omnipotent. She she knew what they were doing in the office, just like she knew they were hiding food by the door for when they left. I knew that they were going to sneak out first thing in the morning after the bugs were gone. She's yeah. omnipotent. Her divineness, mm-hmm. God using her as his vessel. But it kind of the last thing I'm going to talk about here, especially uh, in relation to this story specifically. Is illustrates how so very well how quickly we can be willing to turn on each other, even those that we know and love. And a lot of times that comes from fear and desperation and desperation, being desperately fearful. <laughs> um, but it, it, again, the last several years have illustrated this. How many families have we seen broken up over voting? For something that, in all actuality, one, amounted to nothing, two, had no relevance on your life at all. It is, again, people being made to, being convinced to be afraid of a man, a single person, and anybody who voted for him 
was evil also. And also, the if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. There's no middle ground. That's what it is like with me and my sister. Mm-hmm. She won't talk to me because if I'm not on her side, I am actively a part of the problem. But uh, realistically, we're uh, usually are trying to offer an alternative solution. You know, like her next fear, not being able to maintain her marriage. Mm -hmm. Why does the government need to be involved in marriage at all? The U.S. Constitution has it and like almost all 50 states have freedom of association. I mean, the government can't tell you who you have in your life right. on the mo- most basic level. It's usually not what's actually meant. Freedom of association is getting together to protest. Yeah. But a lot of people interpret it as I can voluntarily interact with whoever I want to. Why should the government have any say in that? Well, it's because people put way too much weight on the government say in marriage anyway. That because, you know... Ultimately, what is your the, the government acknowledging your marriage? What does it give you? Nothing really that you can't get with something else. A will, power of attorney, just changing your last name if you choose to. To a degree. I mean, that will stop a lot of questions. People will make assumptions there. But legally, you don't have any... Just changing your name, you don't necessarily have any rights to anything. I was just pointing out, it's, it's, yeah. it's all stuff that you can do with other things. Right. Essentially, all you need in this situation in regards to marriage, if we're going to continue this tangent for a moment, is just a notary. Yeah. You don't need the government involved in it at all. What business is it of theirs? And, and like, uh, I know one of the things she gets on about is, like, hospital visitations. If she's in the hospital, I can't see it. They ask if you're family. All you got to do is say, yes, they're not searching your paperwork. Right. <laughs> I've been to the hospital with so many people I'm not married to. <laughs> they don't care. I've visited people in the hospital I'm not related to. They don't care. Right. It's a really if, lax system. If the last couple of years have taught us anything, it's these people are highly incompetent in a lot of ways. Or that is something that should be taken away from it. I definitely see it. I deal with these people on a daily basis, and we have to constantly tell them through my job that you need to sign. I need these specific details on this paperwork that you fill out for me every single day. Just because they have a high level degree does not mean people are not dumb. Yeah. Well, we've gotten way off base. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks for that. Back to this. I think another um, fictional medium that illustrates this, how quickly and how easily people can be convinced to turn on each other is Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Mm. There are so, so, so many episodes where a stranger comes in and riles up usually the same group of people, but riles everybody up and they all turn on each other. Yes. A, a particular one of note, if we're going to get off topic again, The uh, there's two African-American characters... Blacks. Grace and Robert E., mm-hmm. who are part of the town. They're the blacksmith, and uh, she owns a cafe. She feeds people. She takes care of everyone, and she's, like, super awesome. And, and then there's just one episode where they're convinced to turn on her, and... Well, there, it's there's a they, few episodes, because there's one specifically where they buy KKK a house, comes in. They buy a house in town, and, like, they attack Grace in a restaurant and cut off all her hair, and... I think it's the KKK one. Yeah. It's all the same one, and just a lot of stuff happens. But they're just... These people you've lived beside all this time, and this one stranger coming right in... for years, didn't they help, it. like, found the town? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, these aren't, you know, just some random blacks who are moving into the neighborhood. They're essentially family to you. But because of this one person drumming up fear and saying the right things to trigger people, it... They find themselves willing to do horrible things. All right. Good reference, though. That is that is a show that does that a lot with all different groups. I think about it a lot. <laughs> Those are usually when you're watching it. Those are usually the episodes I happen to catch. 
<laughs> but there there are a lot. There's probably what three or four per season where that happens. Yeah, they'll turn on Dr. Quinn even though she saved them. The Indians even though they've saved them. Right, you like they've got um nice camaraderie with them and trading partnership and most of the time they're working to protect um which is the dog soldiers. Yeah. Specifically. Yeah, the dog soldiers. You know, they've got Sully who's the, li- the li- liaison between because you know, it's also great about showing that more natural relationship between most homesteaders and the tribal peoples. But yes, it, they they do. That's why I wanted to bring it up. Because it, it's just so good at illustrating how that happens so often. I think you secretly just want to watch it again. Yeah. I'm neither here nor there. <laughs> but, again, after the last few years, especially the last couple with COVID... Mm-hmm. Um, that, this is the whole, realistically, one of the whole reasons why I want to talk about this. Is that we can relate to this story in a lot of ways. Sure, we're not stuck in a grocery store together, but it feels like it in a lot of ways. You know, not not that being isolated, but that we're kind of trapped together. Yeah. And have to deal with each other. And it, it in, in, also in the way that people within the story act and it's like what 87 uh, something um, something like that maybe no maybe it was later think of it no it was like 97 i think anyways the story is not exactly new yeah and i'm sure if you watch this movie the vast majority of us are going to be like ah yeah david he gets it 1980 1980 oh wow um, David gets it, right? Everybody, I, I'm sure most people who are listening to this probably be like, yeah, I relate to David. But, and and I don't want to get into any details about who I think people relate to more because we all have this view. Right. We're all David and certain groups of people are Brent and certain people groups are Miss Carmody. And when in all actuality, we're all a little bit of all of those people. Well, this is, is is this big fear, too. The fear of the unknown. It's that real big one. It is. Um, and like I pointed out, there does come a point where some of us are going to choose the known, choose the unknown over the known. Because we know how bad the known is going to be. And, like, the the unknown fear gets worse and worse with each new monster. Because originally it's just the tentacle, and that's fine. And then there's bugs, and then something comes and eats the bugs, and then they find the spiders. And it's just like, what else is out there? None of these are big enough to cause the earthquake. What else is out there? And then they get out, and the creature that grabs all these is skyscraper, towering, crab-like creature. Mm Mm-hmm. And then later on, there's another tentacly, even larger than the crab creature. More, the one that grabs all is more like praying mantis, I suppose. You know, it's, it's like praying mantis crab. It's weird. Yeah. But it, I'm sure the descriptions from the book to the movie are different because the story, again, I think tries to focus more on the, the cosmic element and the, the unknowedness. Yeah. And, to, and, and then the big one, how far does the mist go? Yes. Is it going to disappear? Will it take the monsters with it? <clears throat> Is it just our town? Is, Is it, it all of the country? Yes. Is it the whole world? Um, but it is just... I want to I pose a moment of action for people and just take some time and, and reflect on the last more than two years. Because, again, like a lot of this... A lot of this started under Obama... I mean, you could take a lot of it back even further if you really want to. If you're nerdy enough in political, in the political sphere, you can go back even further. But like for most of us, it's just been since 2016, which is six years ago. Yeah. And Trump winning the election, 
and reflect on yourself and, and the good parts of yourself, but also what are some of the things that you could have done differently? How could you have viewed things differently? Is everything that you've been told really worth giving yourself over to it? Yeah. The things you've been convinced of. Because when it all comes down to it, we all need to be a little bit of all, all of these people. Even flat earthers? Yes. Because that's what Brent, Brent's group is called, flat earthers. Well, and he does show a proclivity to be more inspired by conspiracies, if you will, um, to be nice about it. Because you can have an interest in conspiracies without actually believing them. Yeah. And there are a good number of things that were conspiracy at one point that are no longer a conspiracy. <laughs> they went from being a conspiracy theory to being conspiracy fact. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that I, I'm a person that has a lot of interest in conspiracy myself, but I don't view that as a bad thing because it's something that keeps me curious and, and helps push my creativity. And then also being a spiritual person, that's kind of a, um, grounding element, if you will, something to hold on to, to keep me going. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the rational side is, you know, balancing those two things out. You know, all right, here's this crazy, kooky thing. It's a fun thing to explore that would actually make a really interesting story. But eh, it doesn't hold a lot of water in reality, right? Right. You know, hey, I'm, you know, spiritual, but I can't let it control my life. You know, we don't, we recognize that human sacrifice and all these things are bad now because, you know, it's murder. <laughs> But it, it, having that diversity and open communication finds us an actual, real, proper solution rather than just focusing on a single thing. And that's the only option there is. Yeah. Can we talk about the end of the movie? If you must. Because I just know they end differently because I saw a review that said they wish the book ended like the movie because they don't like open-ended books. So I'm curious how the movie ended. So it ends, they get in the car. So final conflict in the grocery store. They end up killing this comedy. Mm -hmm. um, Ollie shoots her. Yes. And shoots her in the head. One in, um, double tap. <laughs> and they get to the car and they kind of break up a little bit because creatures come. So there's David and the son and... Amanda, whatever her name is. Amanda. Um, the older teacher lady, Miss Reppel, Repper, whatever. Reppler. Reppler. Um, Ollie, the old guy who came running out of the mist at the beginning of the story. Uh, the store manager, Jim's buddy. Wow, that's a lot of people. Hold on. <laughs> and like one more that I didn't. So like Jim and his buddy separate. Right, Jim goes over to Crazy Church Lady, and his buddy stays with David and them. Uh -huh. So that was an interesting thing. Just to comment on that real quick. Um, but they get out, and Ollie gets to the car first, but the crab thing picks him up and eats him. And then um, Jim's buddy gets eaten by one of the spider creatures, and... The store manager makes it back to the store. And the other random guy gets killed. Because they so asked... it leaves David, his son, Amanda, Repler, and the old guy. And I had an extra thumb, but it might have just been an extra thumb. Because the manager, uh, they try to get him to come, but he's... The captain goes down with his ship. Mm. Kind of thing. I like they they planned out everything for how they were gonna run to the car. Yeah. So those five get in the car and they make it and they drive away. And they're going down to the road and car runs out of gas. There's got to be like eight or nine people. Cause he says he can fit eight or whatever. Anyways, 
Um, they run out, and you, they start hearing the no, or noises. Well, a little bit before that is when they see the giant walking squid, not Cthulhu thing. Um, car runs out of gas. They start hearing noises. They take the gun. They they got the gun still. Mm -hmm. Um, we've only got four bullets left. And David shoots everybody else, including his son. And then the military shows up. Does this happen in a different movie? Because I feel like I've seen this movie, if that's how it ends. We talked about this. Uh, mm -hmm. One with Viggo Mortensen, right? No. The the road or whatever? Oh, yeah, the road. Uh, I don't, it? yeah, I don't remember the road. Maybe I'm confusing it with a mess, because I definitely remember that happening. Because, like, they're in the car, and you bang, 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 bang. Bang. Four bangs. Bangs them all. Except for himself, and, you know, out of hopelessness and desperation, he tried, you know, click, 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 screaming. It's fucking awful. I mean, it's a good ending, but it is awful. <laughs> See, I think I like the book better. I like it open-ended. And it's stupid, because you could use one bullet to take two of them out. You could. He does have that thought in the book. He, he counts the bullets and he says, you know, or he thinks to himself, I'll figure out what to do because he counts the bullets and there's not enough for him. Mm -hmm. I know you can do it. And then a couple kids that I know from when I was younger that double suicided and they put their heads together in one shot. Yeah. But no, in, in the book, they've just, they've stopped at a hotel. Uh the diner and they're eating and they're gonna sleep for the night they've parked real close run in and everything and he's writing everything down and he's gonna leave it on the counter everything that's happened for if it's ever found or whatnot but mm -hmm. they're gonna keep driving and that's it hmm. i'm surprised they didn't go with that because it leaves it open for a sequel yeah thanks for that i hate you now <laughs> i'm sorry no, it, it hurts. It hits the dad button hard. Because, like, I, if I'm going to kill my kids, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to. Because I can't live with that. Yeah. I couldn't. Could have strangled Amanda. Or the old woman. She's not putting up much of a fight. Mm. No, it's, it's like suicide by gun. It's quick and in the moment. And if you try to do anything else, you're going to talk yourself out of it. So, that was The Mist. <laughs> uh, there's a lot to think about. It like, surprisingly, actually, a really good exploration of humanity. At least the movie. I don't know about the book. Story. It was interesting. It did get into human nature a lot, and that primal instinct when uh, society breaks down. Right, because that's part of the one minute and twelve moment when David's, you know, yeah, they're all fine until you take their comforts away. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to become freaking vicious animals because they're not going to know what to do with themselves. Why does losing that childish innocence feel so much like dying? Hmm. It's because you become your whole other self. The self that was before is gone. If you let it. <laughs> i got to figure out what movie this is that I've seen that ends in this way that I think is the road, but now I'm thinking is wrong now that you said this is how this movie ends. But I've watched that one scene with the bugs, and I don't remember that at all. Irrelevant. Moving on. Yeah, moving on. <laughs> well, I uh, forgot to cover this at the beginning for anybody who's a new listener. Uh, the purpose of doing this is for one of us to read the written medium and one of us watches the uh, film version of these stories and see if we can have a conversation about it and judge a pass or fail. So that's what we're going to do real quick. <laughs> so. I'm going to say it's a pass. I think it's a pass. Um, All the topics of discussion were present and accounted for. And, and there wasn't a whole lot of terrible deviation yeah. between the two. Um, not that that matters because is, sometimes you can still have a passing conversation. And just because a conversation is good doesn't mean it's a pass. 
because we've had a few of those now where we've gotten into some good stuff and <laughs> that's just our ability to talk about these things <laughs> um but yeah it, all the themes were on point yes if you will um characters were on point very little deviation there if you will if you will <laughs> one of them was real on point with a double tap if you will <laughs> <laughs> all right um yeah so thanks for listening you made it this far i don't blame you for not good conversation not very enthusiastic though kind of out of sorts right now it's been a long long weekend <laughs> <laughs> and issues right before recording so it's hard to get yourself into that mode sometimes um but yeah uh if you like Tabletop Gaming, check out our other channel, Weird Cat Gaming, link down below. We're also on Odyssey. There is a Twitter available, but it's only for updates, real ch quick channel updates, that way we don't have to spend a lot of time hashing through bullshit here. Um, this is recorded after the Omen, but going up before the Omen, there may or may not be a hiatus that happens in between. I don't know. We'll have to see. Because <laughs> schedule got all screwed up and everything. So. Toodles.